The readings from Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 53, and you'll find it on the Red Bibles on page 1021. Before we read, let's pray. Gracious Lord, thank you that the unfolding of your word brings light and understanding. As we read this passage now and hear it preached, we pray that you would make us truly wise, that we might grow in our love and our loyalty to Jesus. And we pray it for your glory. Amen. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another, not made with hands. Yet even then, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, Jesus said. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, Prophesy! And the guards took him and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entrance. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around them, this fellow is one of them, again. He denied it. After a while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you're one of them, for you're a Galilean. He began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the cock crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the cock crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Thanks, Shelley. Do keep that open because we're going to be looking at that a bit more um, over the next few minutes. But uh, just by way of sort of introduction, I want us to think a bit about peer pressure because peer pressure can make us do some really silly things, can't it? I can still remember clearly what happened at school when I was about 12. Uh, one day at break time, a group of us were moaning about something the teachers had done. I can't remember exactly what it is now, but it's not really that important. In the middle of our grumps, the fire alarm started sounding. Uh, that's all fine, except uh, someone had the bright idea of making a point by not going to the proper assembly point. Uh, we really knew how to protest uh, in our little 12-year-old way. Well, anyway, I, I went along with the crowd and, uh, and stayed away from the main assembly point, feeling a great sense of uh, solidarity with my friends. Later that day, we received a right roasting from the head teacher. And uh, to be fair, I think we deserved it. The fire alarm sounding was not the point to uh, stage a protest over minor gripes about something the teachers had done. But in the moment, oh, it felt so right, so empowering, standing together with the others. But in the cold light of day, it was really rather silly. That's the power of peer pressure, isn't it? Uh, I'm sure we could all remember it as a topic in PSHE lessons at school. Perhaps there's a few pathfinders or travs around the building rolling their eyes at the thought of their PSHE lessons coming up this term. Uh, 
It's a big deal, though, the statistics tell us uh, when it comes to sex and drugs during the teenage years. The impression that everyone's doing it, and you're odd if you're not. But actually, peer pressure comes right the way through life, doesn't it? Uh, the post office scandal's been back in the news this week, and the, the kind of groupthink that developed there uh, in the leadership uh, is really another form of, of peer pressure. We all naturally want to fit in, to be respected and liked, and so we'll all feel the pressure to do things against our better judgment, not to rock the boat, just to go with the flow. Our, our Bible passage today is about peer pressure ratcheted up to the max. What do you do when your life is on the line? Do you conform, keep your head down? What if you were in Peter's shoes? Would you stay true to your principles? What if it meant repercussions, not only for you, but for your nearest and dearest too? Mostly in Cambridge, we don't face questions quite this big. Uh, there are places around the world where our brothers and sisters have to make very difficult choices. Perhaps some of us here have experienced what it's like to face an impossible decision between Jesus and survival. Now, I'm not going to offer a three-step plan for dealing with peer pressure this morning. That's not what our Bible passage is here to do for us. But instead, I want to reflect with you on the Lord Jesus and how he handles himself under extreme pressure. Whether you call yourself a Christian or not this morning, and you're very welcome wherever you count yourself, this passage gives us a wonderful insight into this man just hours before his execution, a man whose life and death have changed the course of human history. Uh, this is the Jesus that Simon and Rachel have said they want to bring up Samuel to know. I want to take us to our passage this morning where we'll see three snapshots of our Saviour. And these um, ideas actually come from the first half of the Bible, the Old Testament written before Jesus. Now, here's the first snapshot I'd like to show you from this passage. Uh, I've called it the silent servant. It's verses 53 to 61. Uh, we join the action at the start of the story late on the Thursday night before the Good Friday. Jesus has just been arrested and his friends have deserted him. Listen to how things go from there. Verse 53, they took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. So Mark begins here by, by whetting our appetite for what's coming up later. Peter made the bold pronouncement early in the evening that he'd never disown Jesus. And perhaps he's right. At least he's not hiding like the others. We'll come back to him in a bit. For now, Mark turns our attention to the religious leaders. The Sanhedrin was a council made of older men, the chief governing body of the Jews. There are about 70 members, powerful men, really quite an intimidating crowd. Now Mark tells us how they set out to get what they wanted. So verse 55, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they didn't find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I'll destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. Yet even then their testimony didn't agree. It's a real problem for the religious leaders here, because biblical law codes state that you need more than one witness, especially to convict someone of a capital offence. But the religious leaders can't even organise some liars to say, stay on message. Now, this idea of destroying and rebuilding the temple is an interesting one. Jesus hasn't really said much about this in what Mark's recorded for us so far. What we have seen is the judgment that Jesus enacts on the temple and predicts for the temple. The temple was meant to be a place where humanity could encounter God. But instead, in Jesus' day, it had turned into a place of mere human rituals and immorality. Immorality. 
So there's some truth in his accusation, in their accusation, sorry. But in reality, the religious leaders are starting to get desperate. Sensing this opportunity to get rid of Jesus might be slipping from their grasp. So in verse 6, they ratchet up the pressure further. Then the high priest stood before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. He's faced all sorts of false and outlandish accusations and he just stays silent. Can you imagine being in a room of 70 hostile men, a handful of grubby witnesses, facing all sorts of mudslinging in the middle of the dark night, deserted by your friends, all the while knowing that your very life hangs in the balance. It's a horrendous situation. But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Can you feel the injustice of the situation boiling up inside? How dare they treat an innocent man this way? Who do they think they are, putting him in front of this kangaroo court, making up all sorts of lies about him? But also you wonder about Jesus. Why don't you just say something? You know it's all lies. Why don't you just defend yourself, Jesus? Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. It's such remarkable grace and composure in the face of unimaginable pressure. But actually, it's just the way God said it would be. Let me share some words with you from Isaiah chapter 53, written 700 years before Jesus. It speaks of the coming servant of the Lord, and this is what Isaiah writes. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. And then down in verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silence, silent, so he did not open his mouth. It's all coming true. And so in Mark 14, Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. He was biding his time, really, standing as a prisoner before this room of powerful men. Jesus was in control. He knew he was God's servant. He knew God's plan. He knew what was coming. He knew he would be crushed and pierced so that he could save us. And so he stood there in silence. Just let that sink in for a moment, what Jesus was doing here for us. Jesus stood there in silence for me, for you. Let me take us on to the next snapshot of Jesus here. He's the silent servant He's also the exalted son. What is it that finally gets Jesus to break his silence that night? Well, it's, it's this question from the high priest, isn't it? Verse 61, halfway through. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Now, before we get to Jesus' answer, I just want to linger on this question for a moment. In Greek, questions can be phrased in the same way as statements. Um, here it's just the kind of the intonation, the pronunciation, that, sorry, the punctuation that, that shows it's a question. And so from the high priest's lips, we get one of the great articulations of Jesus' identity in the whole gospel. You are the Messiah, the son of the blessed one. 
It's exactly the same words that Peter used at that great moment back in chapter 8 when Jesus asks, who do you say I am? You are the Messiah, Peter answers. And this idea of the, the son of the blessed one, the son of God, has been in the mix since the start of the gospel as well. You might know that Mark opens by saying the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. At Jesus' baptism, God's voice rings out from heaven, you are my Son, whom I love. And there's other things I can mention here, but it's basically all building towards that great moment as Jesus dies. And the Roman centurion, stood at the foot of the cross, exclaims, surely this man was the Son of God. Mark wants us to see that Jesus isn't just any man. He's not some quirky first century teacher or prophet. No, it's, it's more than that, just as Jesus says in verse 62. Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. What an answer. What a way to break his silence. Jesus lays claim to a place with God himself on the throne of heaven. It's perhaps slightly odd imagery until you realize that Jesus is recalling a vision from the prophet Daniel, chapter 7. Let me read that to you. Daniel writes there, <clears throat> In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So this human figure is exalted, worshipped and glorified by all people everywhere. His authority and dominion are everlasting. He will act as the judge of all people, defining their destiny forever. And so for Jesus, not only the Son of God, but this Son of Man. It's a staggering claim for a lonely, bedraggled, weary man to make before a Jewish council of hostile leaders. This is our Jesus, the exalted son, the one we're called to follow and to know, to worship and obey. He holds our destiny in his hands. One day he will come on the clouds of heaven to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. So how are you responding to him today it's a vital question that each of us must answer for ourselves no peer pressure either positive or negative will count on that day when we see him coming on the clouds of heaven will that be a day of wonderful welcome or of fearful realization in reality jesus is the exalted son but for the religious leaders, this was all too much. Verse 63, the high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. It looks like Jesus has just sealed his fate, doesn't it? It's a brutal experience. I used to do some uh, undergraduate supervision for the divinity faculty. Um, one of the first year essay questions I particularly enjoyed uh, doing with the students was uh, this. It was the question, why was Jesus crucified? I loved looking at this topic. Uh, it's widely agreed that he was killed in this way on a cross. But the question why gets us thinking about the different agents involved. The Jewish religious leaders might say that Jesus was crucified because he broke the law. He blasphemed. We'll see next week that the Roman leaders might say that Jesus was crucified because he was a threat to the peace. But there's another layer to the issue. 
Something we see the whole way through. Why was Jesus crucified? Well, because it was God's plan which Jesus willingly embraced. Jesus didn't shy away from giving the answer that he knew full well would lead to his condemnation and death. He didn't stay silent when he knew that beating and mocking and crucifixion would result. He's the silent servant and he's also the exalted son. It might be hard to believe that in the midst of that dark, lonely night, but it's the truth, the reality. And then the final snapshot, which we'll touch on more briefly, that Jesus is the deserted shepherd. It's perhaps a bit odd to say these verses give us a snapshot of Jesus because it doesn't look like he's actively involved. That they're, not in, they're actually, though, unfolding precisely what Jesus had predicted earlier in the chapter. So just look back over the page with me to verse 30. This was a bit earlier on that Thursday evening. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the cock crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I'll never disown you. Well, Peter's been pretty brave, hasn't he, in following Jesus to the high priest's house. But this is the point where his courage falters. Three times he's asked about his relationship with Jesus, and three times he denies knowing him with increasing forcefulness. Until you get down to verse 71, Peter began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Such a long way from the confidence a few hours earlier. And so verse 72, immediately the cock crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the cock crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. It's like the bottom had fallen out of Peter's world. It's a devastating moment as he realizes what he's done. It's Worse than falling asleep like he'd done early in the evening when Jesus asked him to watch and pray, he'd gone and denied his Lord. He pretended he didn't know Jesus. He, he hated what he'd done. He wept bitterly. I like the way one commentator puts it. Jesus retains his integrity at the cost of his life. Peter forfeits his integrity to preserve his own life. And I wonder if any of us can relate to Peter here. Few of us have ever faced this kind of pressure, but many of us will have done things we bitterly regret. Things that feel like they've irreversibly broken relationships, that feel unforgivable. Things that make us weep deep into the night. Well, some of Peter's worst deeds are recorded forever in Scripture. And they help us to see that we're not alone in these things. But Jesus, Jesus was all alone. I said that this section is a snapshot of him as the deserted shepherd. And that's in fulfillment of Zechariah 13, which he'd quoted earlier that evening, where it says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And all the disciples have now deserted Jesus. They've been scattered. Peter disowned him. He's the deserted shepherd, all alone, struck, and soon to be dead. And we often think about Peter as we reach the end of um, chapter 14, but what must it have been like for Jesus as he heard that cock crow the second time, knowing his prediction was then complete? The religious leaders had mocked him and called on him to prophesy Well, he had done, and now it was fulfilled. He was all alone, deserted, and despised. No one was standing by his side. No one was supporting him. No one was there for him. He was all alone. And that shows us something about what he was doing because he alone can save the world. He alone could stand firm through this time of testing. 
Now, this is the last we see of Peter in Mark's Gospel. Stood outside alone, weeping in the dead of night, complete failure. And yet it's not the end of the story for him. And in fact, it's not the last time that he's mentioned in the gospel. Did you know this? I gave a a nod in this direction on Easter Day a couple of weeks ago. Turn with me to chapter 16 and verse 7. Here's the angel speaking to the women on the first Easter morning. The angel says, go tell his disciples and Peter... He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Jesus wants to see his friends despite the fact they deserted him. But why mention Peter specifically? Isn't it a deliberate note of hope for this failed disciple? Jesus even wanted to see Peter, who disowned him so shamefully. This was a lesson Peter never forgot. Just a few months later, he found himself standing before the same Sanhedrin that had condemned Jesus to death. This time, Peter was on trial for promoting Jesus. This time, instead of denying knowledge of Jesus, he's proclaiming Jesus. It's like we sang earlier. Salvation is found in no one else, Peter said, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Sometimes it's only when we've seen the full extent of our weakness and failures that God can begin to remake us into truly confident and courageous disciples. Peter's experience of failure and restoration shaped the rest of his life. The grace of Jesus made him new. You can really see that as he speaks about suffering and salvation in his letters later in the New Testament. He knew Jesus, the silent servant, who suffered for our sin. He knew Jesus, the exalted son, who welcomes his people into his eternal kingdom. And he knew Jesus, the deserted shepherd, who stands alone, so that we need never be alone. We may face all kinds of peer pressure through life. We may do things that are silly or worse. But because of Jesus, we're never alone and our failures are never terminal. There's always a way back and a way on towards Christ's kingdom. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Father, how we thank you for the Lord Jesus, for his faithfulness in the midst of human faithlessness. We thank you that he was the silent servant who suffered for our sin. We praise him as the exalted son who welcomes people into his eternal kingdom. And we thank you that he was willing to be the deserted shepherd who stands alone so that we need never be alone. Amen.